McCluskey. Good afternoon to everyone. Raise your hand if you remember where you were on this day 20 years ago. I'll date myself and I'll tell you I was sitting in first period of high school. I had a second period study hall in a computer lab which proved to be moot as servers for most news sites were bogged down by too many users. I remember spending most of the day watching news feeds on classroom televisions. I remember watching more at home. I remember the feeling that we as a collective nation felt in realizing we were not safe, or maybe that we never had been. We felt as if our identity as a protected and special land was spinning out of control. Charlie and Theo have a Sabbath book called It Will Be Okay by Lisa Turkhurst. The book is about a seed who lives in a seed packet on a shelf in a farmer's shed. The seed befriends a fox who is hiding in the shed from the rain and wind outside. Both the seed and the fox are comfortable living in the shed and don't want anything to change. One morning, the farmer came into the shed as he had on many days. Little seed, he said, as he placed him in his hand, I have a wonderful plan for you. I have waited for just the right time, and today is the day. Oh no, please no, I don't want to go, thought the little seed. The farmer went outside and knelt down. He pushed little seed under the ground, into the dirt, and down to a deep, dark, messy place. Now, little seed, this is going to be different, and it might seem scary, but it will be okay. You can trust me, said the farmer. Little seed wished he were inside the cozy packet on the rickety shelf in the farmer's dusty shed. I want to trust even when I can't see, but how in the world is this good for me? Now little fox was really worried. Little seed, he shouted. I'm here, I'm here, way down in the dirt. I'm scared and I'm lonely, but I'm not hurt, came the little seed's muffled voice right below him. Little Fox thought for something to say or something to do that would help his friend not be scared, but he was afraid too. It's different and scary to be someplace new, but it will be okay, Little Seed. Little Seed was not so sure, and neither was Little Fox. But the farmer was good, and the farmer was kind, and the farmer was always watching over them, even when they didn't know it. How many times do we feel trapped in the dirt, longing for better days, which have long since passed. I thought it would be good, especially today on this 20 year anniversary of the attack on our country, to talk about what to do when we feel like we've been put in the dirt, when our circumstances seem unbearably out of our control. My message revolves around two themes, trust in God's plan and obeying his direction. And we'll get three lessons from them and I'm gonna give them to you right off the top. Lesson one, God is playing chess while the rest of us are playing checkers. Lesson two, at the beginning, and when all else fails, stand still. And lesson three, when a prophet asks you for bread, you had better get to baking. Let's start in Exodus 14. Really, you don't need to turn there. We've been through this story so many times, but I will, and I, I will read a quote out of the New King James. Exodus 14, verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Lesson one, we are playing checkers while God is playing chess. Israel is backed into a corner with Pharaoh and his army advancing. Now, if you've ever played checkers and you're backed into a corner and somebody's there right in front of you, there's nothing left to do but die. And to Israel and to the Egyptians, there was nothing left for them to do but to surrender or die. But God playing chess knows that Israel is capable of making moves that they don't see. So they believe they can only move diagonally out of the box. 
what does God say? Well, first of all, I guess let's, let's see what Moses says. We'll get lesson two here. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So stand still. Sometimes there's nothing for us to do but stand still and wait to see what God has planned. When you're all out of ideas and backed into a corner, it's a good time to stand still. Verse 15, what is the result of this? And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Now I think this is funny because I, I picture I picture the Israelites crying to Moses and Moses says, stand still. Wait and see what happens. And then he looks up and says, what's going to happen? <laughs> and the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. We're not going to move diagonal. We're going to move to the side. We can't move to the side. Well, that's what we're going to do. But lift up your rods. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Duh. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. God delivers Israel through a path that defies all human logic and reasoning, seemingly bending the laws of physics. God is playing chess while the rest of us are playing checkers. The story of Joseph came to mind. We won't turn there for time. Joseph had it made. He was Jacob's most loved son. He was having dreams of great things happening to him and his brothers bowing down to him. He even had a cool coat. Then it all went south. Talk about being planted in the dirt. Joseph is literally thrown into a pit, then locked away in a prison cell. Now you could argue that physically he had no choice but to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, but he certainly had the choice to mentally do the same. Joseph chose to trust in God and remained obedient to him, and God was able to carry out his plan through Joseph due to that obedience. We're going to spend the second half of this in the story of Elijah, so turn to 1 Kings 17, please. 1 Kings 17. We're going to pick up verse 7 here to get a little feel for where we're at in Elijah's journey. He has been fed by birds at this point and is getting his water from a brook. 1 Kings 17, verse 7. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate to the city, indeed, a widow was there, gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please, bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. Verse 11. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. So there's a couple of thoughts here at the beginning of this. The first was that Elijah shows obedience by going to find the widow. The second was that the widow didn't seem to be in on the secret at this point. God said he commanded the widow, but it was more by his will that this widow was going to be here in this place. He set this up to happen, but it doesn't seem that the widow is excited to see him. She doesn't see him as being her answer. She says, yeah, great, you're here. Glad you want the last bit of bread that I was going to bake before we died. Okay, this is, this is fine. I'll get your water. But... We see here in verse 13, Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her, hus her, her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So the widow shows obedience at this point by baking the bread, which is truly our lesson three here. When a prophet asks you for bread, you had better get to baking. So what's the result of this? Verse 17, Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, 
What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring me my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Does this remind you of what Israel said to Moses when they were backed into a corner? Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Why are you here to bring my sin to remembrance and to watch my son die now? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him down on his bed. Now this is a moment of standing still for this widow. This is an incredible moment where she's standing downstairs and her lifeless son is carried up into another room. He laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodged by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Then Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Did God use the widow to save Elijah? Or did God use Elijah to save the son and the widow? All the above, this is a game of chess that we could not understand. Little seeds sat in that dark and messy place for what seemed like a very long time. But one spring morning, little seed felt a mysterious stirring. He looked down and discovered he was no longer a little seed. He was becoming something brand new, something wonderful. He pushed up through the dirt and out of the dirt and ran, th ran through the ground. And there, looking sleepy-eyed and surprised, was his friend, Little Fox. Little Fox looked down and saw a beautiful green sprout. My friend, they each exclaimed with glee. They were once again nose to nose, and Little Seed told silly stories, and Little Fox made funny faces. After many days of fun, Little Seed said, Little Fox, look up and see. It's hard to believe what's become of me. From the messy, dark place I grew and grew, from a seed to a tree, only the farmer knew. Together they made it through the dark and scary time, and together they each learned that the farmer was good, and the farmer was kind, and the farmer was always watching over them, even in a dark, messy place. Little Seed was, n was never supposed to be just a seed in a packet. And Little Fox was not supposed to be alone and afraid. The seasons came and the seasons went. Little Seed grew into a big, strong tree, and Little Fox raced around his tree trunk, and sometimes Little Fox lay in the tall, cool grass near Little Seed. The seed didn't even know it had the potential to become a tree. But the farmer did. The farmer needed to plant the seed in unknown, scary conditions to bring out its fullest potential. God backed Israel against a sea in order to destroy Pharaoh's horsemen and chariots. God brought Joseph through slavery and imprisonment in order to make him second in command over Egypt and to provide for his family in a famine. God used a widow to care for Elijah and used Elijah to provide for a widow and to save her dying son. Jesus talks about how there will be wars and rumors of wars all around us. And we certainly have plenty of rumors of war, both figuratively and literally. Turn on the news and it's nothing but catastrophe. It's easy to feel as if we're spinning out of control. That's because we're half right. We are out of control. We're just not spinning. What happens when we try to dig ourselves out of the dirt we're in? Well, sometimes God shows us there's far worse dirt. Sometimes God forces us out of the boat we're fleeing in and then has a whale swallow us and we can grow and mature in the dark, smelly belly of that whale. That would qualify as worse dirt. Even in the worst of circumstances, God knows what is best for us. And what seems like an uncomfortable and painful situation can be just the environment we need to grow and mature into more that we, than we knew we were capable of becoming. But God wants us to do our part, and our role greatly involves trust in him and an ear toward obedience. So the next time you're taken from your cozy and familiar seed packet and placed into the dirt, just remember, the farmer is good and the farmer is kind, and the farmer is always watching out for you, even when you don't know it. <laughs>